That word nonviolence probably reminds most of us of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and Mahatma Gandhi. Some of you have been involved in nonviolent action from probably the 60s up to today. Some of you have personally used nonviolent resistance to create social change. Others of you have either watched these movements on the news or read about them in history books. Whatever the point of connection, you've certainly heard of nonviolence. I want you to think for a minute of all the wacky theological terminology you've heard from up here at the pulpit. I have a hunch that you are way for more familiar with nonviolence than you are with most of those ideas. My point is, this political, social, spiritual strategy is a huge current in our world. Today I want to talk about how our religious history contributed mightily to that current of nonviolence. For some kind of complicated reasons, our Unitarian forebears tend to get most of the credit for influencing the world. And this is even true when we talk about nonviolence. Henry David Thoreau, one of the best known of our forebears, changed the world when he decided not to pay his poll taxes one day. In 1843, Thoreau refused to pay the taxes to protest slavery and the Mexican-American War. Incidentally, the tax collector was a personal friend of his. This is very Thoreau, like he seems extreme, but it's questionable. The tax collector offered to lower the fee. He even offered to pay the fee himself because he was a friend, but Thoreau refused on moral grounds and spent the night in jail. The intellectual fruit of that little adventure was his essay, Civil Disobedience. It's one of the most influential pieces of political writing ever to come out of America. And it impacted the entire world. Leo Tolstoy, the Russian author and social activist, was deeply impacted by civil disobedience. In fact, he was such a fan that he arranged to have it translated into Russian for publication there. Mahatma Gandhi read Civil Disobedience in 1906, really early in his career, when he was still in South Africa, working to improve the rights of immigrants there. He later, he later said, Thoreau's ideas influenced me greatly. I adopted some of them and recommended the study of Thoreau to all of my friends. Why, I actually took the name of my movement from Thoreau's essay. That's a whole lot of mileage from one essay that grew out of spending one night in jail for not paying taxes. Unitarians, especially the transcendentalists like Thoreau and Emerson, get a whole lot of attention. But this sermon isn't called Unitarian Roots of Nonviolence. This is Universalist Roots of Nonviolence. Those roots are most easily traced through two figures of universalism, Hosea Ballou and Aidan Ballou. The two Reverend Ballous were distant cousins at the turn of the 19th century. Hosea, the older one, was born in 1771. He grew up in the backwoods of New Hampshire. His father was a Baptist preacher and a farmer. His mother died before Hosea turned two years old. In his rural life, there were pretty limited opportunities for education, and he mostly learned about farming. After joining his father's church, Hosea began to have some questions about his own faith. So he read anything that he could get his hands on to answer those questions. It's said that one day his father found Hosea reading in the kitchen and asked what that book was. When Hosea told him it was a universalist book, his father declared that he couldn't allow that type of book in his house. So the boy hid his heretical book in the woodpile. Later, his father found the secret book hidden in the woodpile. 
it turns out this universalist book was in fact the Bible. From humble beginnings, Hosea Ballou grew into a hugely influential universalist minister. In those days, universalists tended to be in much more rural settings. <clears throat> so even if they had a settled ministry, they traveled around the countryside sharing their preaching in the far out reaches. <clears throat> so due to his preaching around and his writing and his work in the denomination, he really is one of the most prominent figures of universalism. His most influential piece of writing was called A Treatise on Atonement. In the book, he advocated for the use of reason and history to interpret the Bible. As a side note, that was about 40 years before Unitarians made that claim. But the really important messages were about sin and salvation. Remember, universalism is all about rejecting the idea of God punishing people after death for their sins. So in this book, Ballou rejected the idea of original sin and he rejected the idea of Jesus suffering on the cross as a sacrifice for human sin. These were radical ideas that charted the course for universalism. And I know all this talk about Jesus suffering on the cross and punishment in hell is pretty far removed from our core concerns today. It takes a little bit of translating, but the message holds strong. The rejection of original sin is pretty simple. That translates nicely into our first principle. We recognize the inherent worth and dignity of every person. We're not depraved sinners, quite the opposite. We are, all of us, basically good. And Jesus' purpose in life wasn't to suffer on a cross for sins. Jesus lived to teach people to love and respect one another. That picture of a vengeful God that would punish people in hell for eternity, that version of God that would intentionally sacrifice his own son to be tortured, universalists weren't going to have any part of that. We are not interested in any part of that. Universalism at its core suggests that the major driving force in the world isn't punishment, it's love. Love wins, not punishment or retribution. Compassion, generosity, rebuilding, and growth is what will save this world. That's our calling. As some UUs have said it in recent years, our task is to love the hell out of the world. <laughs> Hosea Ballou took a pretty radical stance. He wrote that the orthodox view of a wrathful God wasn't just wrong, it was actually bad for people who believed it. It hardened human hearts. He wrote, by having such an example constantly before their eyes, they've become so transformed into its image that whenever they have had the power they have actually executed a vengeance on men and women, which is evinced that the cruelty of their doctrine had overcome the native kindness and compassion of the human heart. You see, what, he, what we believe about God and the universe matters. What we believe about humanity and the world around us matters. It can all be about punishment, Scarcity and pain, or it can be about love, forgiveness, abundance, and growth. We make choices about how we see the world, and those choices impact how we live in it. Universalism and nonviolence, of course, doesn't end with Hosea Ballou. Remember his cousin that I also mentioned, Aiden. Aiden had a much more direct impact on nonviolence. He was born in 1803, just 
20 years after the Revolutionary War, and he lived through the Civil War. He had plenty of opportunity to consider military violence. It's said that when Aiden was a young boy, he went with his family to see a parade of militia in Rhode Island. And as a young boy, he was mesmerized by the swords and the guns and the colorful uniforms. He told his dad that if a war were to come, he would gladly join up in the cause. Just a few years later, his family uh, joined, a, joined in the sort of revivalism of the time and became much more involved in their church. And Aiden studied with intensity for his age. He was especially impacted by the Sermon on the Mount and Jesus' instructions about nonviolence. You're almost certainly familiar with this passion, with this passage. It says, You've heard it said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, but I say to you, do not resist one who is evil. But if anyone strikes you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. And if anyone would take your coat, let him have your cloak as well. And if anyone force you to go one mile, go with him two miles. Those words settled into young Aiden. At 19, he followed his call into the ministry and in his parents' evangelical church. Over time, through study, and the influence of his older cousin, he shifted his ideas to universalism. But along with that shift came a deep commitment to nonviolence. Remember, in those days, slavery was still legal and the Civil War was brewing. His commitment to nonviolence was far less theoretical than yours or mine would be today. And he was a committed abolitionist. This is really complicated, this stuff. I mean, later this month, we'll talk more about Unitarian Universalists and military violence. I don't know that pacifism in the face of slavery was the best choice, but it was his commitment to end slavery that deepened Aidan Ballou's stance on nonviolence. He wasn't alone in that. He actually joined with some other nonviolent folks and wrote a book called The Standard of Practical Christianity. And I know the, sound, the name sounds incredibly boring. <laughs> the Standard of Practical Christianity. The contents were anything but boring. Those pages were a kind of outlandish blueprint for an anarchist, socialist, nonviolent Christianity. They believed that Dependence on force to maintain order was unjust, and they vowed to not participate in any government, including their own, that relied on violence. The document said, We cannot employ carnal weapons nor any physical violence whatsoever, not even for the preservation of our lives. We cannot render evil for evil, nor do otherwise than love our enemies. It's not like they made that love our enemies line up. These guys took the Sermon on the Mount quite seriously. In his deep awareness of a broken world, his desire to change the evil of that world, Aidan Ballou advocated nonviolence to avoid becoming a part of that evil and that brokenness. It turns out that down the road, Leo Tolstoy, back in Russia, was also profoundly moved by Aidan Ballou's book and his ideas about nonviolent resistance. Tolstoy included many of his ideas in his own writing. He even said, one would have thought Ballou's work would have been well known, but the ideas expressed by him, that, that the ideas expressed by him would either be accepted or refuted, but such has not been the case. His influence on Tolstoy almost certainly trickled down to Gandhi and to Martin Luther King Jr. 
Now this has been a rather detailed tracking of our universalist roots in nonviolence. You might be asking, why does it matter? It matters because nonviolence is embedded in our universalist theology. And universalism isn't some side tangent. It's part of the name of who we are. It's a big, bold statement that love and forgiveness, not punishment and suffering, is what it's all about. Love wins. That is still a revolutionary idea. This week, I can't help from wondering, what if we took to heart the message of Aidan and Hosea Ballou? What if we let go of the idea of suffering as redemptive? What if we let go of the belief that punishment was productive? What if we completely let go of the belief that punishment was a means to positive results? This is part of what universalism is about. It's not just the idea that God wouldn't punish people for eternity in hell for their sins. It's that punishment is not the name of the game. Revenge is not the name of the game. For our children, for our sense of safety and order, for helping others to see what we see, what if we replace the sense of punishment and revenge with compassion. Amen.